All right, so today's event, um, Nuts and Bolts, Identifying Migratory Seasonal and Agricultural Workers and Their Families in Your Health Center webinar. And this is the second in a two-part webinar series brought to you in partnership between the Community Health Association of Mountain Plain States, or CHAMPS, which is the Region 8 Primary Care Association, and the Northwest Regional Primary Care Association, or NWRPCA, which is the Region 10 PCA. I'm Valerie Seinmetz, the Programs Outreach and Enrollment Coordinator for CHAMPS, and I will be moderating today's webinar. Today's event is free for health centers and primary care associations in Region 8, which includes Colorado, Montana, North Dakota, South Dakota, Utah, and Wyoming, and in Region 10, which covers Alaska, Idaho, Oregon, and Washington. All other participants will be sent an invoice after today's webinar. This webinar is being recorded for future reference as well. All participants are in listen-only mode, so questions should be submitted using the questions box in the control bar on the right side of your screen. Please feel free to submit questions at any time during today's event, and we'll do our best to answer them all by the end of the webinar. Also, if you need technical assistance at any time during the event, please submit a comment using the same questions box, and we'll help you out as soon as possible. Please note that if you're having visual problems during the event, try pressing F5 to refresh your screen or try using a different internet browser. So to quickly practice uh, submitting questions, we'd like everyone to use the questions box to tell us how many uh, total people are watching this, this event at your computer today. Um, and please include yourself in that count. So the questions box is on the right as in the control bar on the right side of your screen. We'll give everyone just a minute to do that. All right, and a bit more about your hosting organizations, and then we'll turn it over uh, to our first presenter. So CHAMPS is a nonprofit membership association of community migrant and homeless health centers in Region 8. CHAMPS was founded in 1985 to unite Region 8 health centers in an advocacy and mutual support network of these community-based providers of primary care and related services for underserved communities. CHAMPS is dedicated to supporting these organizations by providing opportunities for education and training, networking, and workforce development. For more information on CHAMPS and our programs and services, please visit champsonline.org. NWRPCA is the Region 10 Primary Care Association, providing training and technical assistance to health centers and primary care associations uh, in Alaska, Idaho, Oregon, and Washington. To find out more about NWRPCA, please visit nwrpca.org. And now I will turn it over to our first presenter, Bobby Ryder. Bobby is the President and Chief Executive Officer with the National Center for Farm Worker Health. Bobby gives NCFH the benefit of many years of personal involvement with migrant families through community advocacy and professional migrant health program experience. Bobby, thank you so much for taking the time to be with us today. And I will now turn the webinar over to you. Hi there. Thank you so much. I appreciate it, Valerie. Hello, everyone. I see we have quite a few people online, and I'm happy to be with you today. I've got a real simple agenda here for you, starting out with who. So the thing that we need to do is to move forward here with our next slides, because we're going to talk about not only who is involved in identifying farm workers and reporting them, but who you need to capture information on. Um, the best ways to get it done, the how and why, and then we've got some resources to share with you. So let me make sure my mouse is working here and I can go forward and that's not working, Valerie. So if you want to move, there we go, excerpt. So I'm going to start out right, right off the bat with an excerpt from one of my favorite federal documents, the 2017 UDS. And you might notice that this is from 17 and we're in 18. 
so the best thing to do is to use this as your guide for 18. There will be some additional guidance that will come out from the Bureau of Primary Health Care prior to the end of 2018. But on pages 38, 39, and 40, starting with 38, there's this excerpt that says, this section of the Uniform Data System asks for a count of patients from targeted special populations, including persons who are homeless, migratory, seasonal agricultural workers, and their family members, patients who are served by school-based health centers, and I'm going to drop down to public housing and veterans. So those, those special populations that I have highlighted there with colored font are the five categories that are required to be identified at your front desk that identification is required to be included in their registration process and then reported on this UDS report. Now, many of you may be more uh, less involved in the preparation of the UDS and more involved in registering patients. And I hope that we have a few people who are also here um, from the administration office that are responsible for submitting the report. But I have to tell you that many health centers are not aware of the fact that they are expected to identify all of these special populations. They, there is a popular perception that they only need to identify special populations that they receive special funding for. So going on to read, all health centers report these populations regardless of whether or not they receive, they directly receive special population funding. And migratory and seasonal agricultural worker status must be verified at least every two years by migrant health center grantees. So I think we have a question coming up next. And Valerie, my mouse is not moving, so I'm going to let you take care of that. So the, the poll question is, is your health center in compliance with the requirement that you identify and report these five targeted special populations? So we'd like to know the answers to those questions from our participants. All right, and participants can go ahead and just select the, the answer that best fits um, their organization and then hit submit. I will give everyone a few seconds to do this, and then I will um, show the results. You know, it occurs to me I shouldn't have used the word compliance. That has so much weight attached to it these days. Really, what we're looking for is just a, a guess, an estimate as to whether or not people are doing that on a routine basis. So, 80%? Right. That's yep, great. Yep, 80% said yes. That's fabulous. Um, no no's and a little bit of not sure. So that would be a good thing to double check on. So next slide. Um, so I'm going to, th this, this session is titled Nuts and Bolts, and I'm going to get into the nuts and bolts of this process real quickly here for you. And I assume that all of you have downloaded this, this handout and have it. I'm, I've highlighted several of the key words that I think are really important here for you. This comes verbatim out of the law or the statute, and it is also verbatim as to what is reflected in the UDS in terms of definition of migratory and seasonal agricultural workers. You'll see that acronym several times. So we look at the words principal, seasonal basis, seasonal basis again, aged and disabled farm workers, I'm reading the red, and then age or disability. So when I think most of you are probably pretty familiar with these definitions, but what is not understood very widely is that there are there are phrases and words in the law and in the UDS that are not defined. So principal employment, does that mean that they earn 50% or more of their income from farm labor? Does it's not defined. So that's up to your health center to define. And it is ultimately up to the patient to des decide and to define. We have a lot of farm workers that will work. They consider agriculture to be their primary employment or their principal employment, but they'll do anything else on a seasonal basis that's available to them to augment their family income. So seasonal basis, another, another phrase that is not defined in either the law or the statute. For purposes of this definition, I recommend, and, and NCFH recommends, that we look at that in terms of fluctuations of income. So if people are working, sometimes people have a job on a year-round basis. 
But that doesn't mean that they're earning the same check week in and week out because the amount of work that they have available is fluctuates. So don't don't not include people who have year-round employment if their work is seasonal in nature and their income is seasonal in nature. So in a situation like this where the statute is not defined, what we want you to do is to think about the intent of Congress in creating the program. When I talk about age and disability, um, it's interesting because in one line it says age and disabled, and the next line it says age or disabled. And so for a lot of people, that means you have to be both old and, and disabled. But that's not what the statute says. The statute says age or disability, and it doesn't define age, and it doesn't define disability. So thinking again about the intent of Congress, these this is not... Um, what we're trying to do is to classify people according to their employment. It's not about determining whether they're eligible to be on the sliding fee scale or not. It's just whether or not we consider them farm workers. And I believe that the intent of Congress is that we reach out and serve these people. And unless you've got serious, serious doubts, I would classify them as a farm worker if they're engaged in farm labor. Don't let the principal employment or the seasonality interfere with your ability to identify those people who are working in agriculture. So next slide. So a question right. for you. Go ahead. Um, so our, our next poll. Um, is your health center routinely identifying former aged and or disabled migratory and seasonal agriculture workers and their families as a part of the patient registration process? So go ahead and click the answer that best fits your organization and then please hit submit and I will give everyone a few seconds to do that and then share the results. All right, I'm going to go ahead and close the poll. All right, and it looks like 86% said yes, and about 14% were unsure. Okay. Well, for the 14% of you who are unsure, if if by any chance you're not, and this helps you to get it right, we are very grateful. So the next question here is, who reports? what and where do you report it? So the UDS guidance says only health centers that receive Section 330G funding, that's Migrant Health Center funding, should fill out the answers to lines 14 and 15 and 16. But all other, other health centers only report on line 16. And we're going to look in a minute at what lines, what those lines are. And what you'll see is that 14 and 15 I'll ask you to separate out migratory and seasonal. And line 16 aggregates both numbers together. So the good news is if your health center doesn't have special funding, you don't have to break that data down. You can just put it on line 16. Okay, next. So question, and this is a trick question. Um, if your health center is a public health center, a public PHS 330G funded migrant health center, on what line of your UDS should you report former aged and or disabled migratory workers and their families? So participants, please go ahead and enter your responses into the questions box, and that's located on the right side of your um, GoToWebinar control panel. And I'll give everyone a couple of minutes to do that, and then we will, I'll, I'll read the answers as they come in. So it could be that we have people who are not involved in the preparation of the UDS and would not by any stretch of imagination know the answer to this question, and that's a perfectly okay answer. Yeah, so we've had one person say they're not sure. So why don't okay. we um, continue on and we'll um, hopefully change that. So let me let me give you the reason that I put that question there, and thank you, that's a great great segue. And that is because when you look at this table, which is table four of the UDS, what you will see is that there is no place 
to put former migratory farm workers and their family members who are either aged or disabled and no longer able to work in ag for that purpose. There's no place to put it. And so we strongly recommend that you put that under on line 14 because the question is former migratory farm workers. So that's where we recommend that you put that. The most important thing is that you put it on one line or another. So that that should be an in-house decision until the fact until the time that the bureau either adds that line or or collapses them into one line for migratory and seasonal. Okay, so then the next slide. Um, I have a contrast here for you between the statutory language or the language in the law and the language in the UDS. And again, I've used color to kind of highlight things. Um, members of families is a phrase that's used in statute. And by the way, the law always trumps administrative guidance. So the statutory language is the most important and it's your default go-to. So if there's ever any question as to what the intent of Congress is, sometimes administrative policy gets it a little bit wrong. And in this case, we've been working with the Bureau of Primary Health Care for a couple of years, and they have been working very hard to align their language in the UDS guidance with the statute. So you'll see when you look at the right-hand side of the page that I have highlighted the word dependent in red. So they've actually removed the word dependent in a couple of other places. And the reason that that's important is because in my white Anglo-Saxon world, dependent means legal dependent. But we all know among migratory and seasonal farm worker families, there are often large extended families, and it might be a cousin or an uncle or a grandmother who is a member of the household and a, therefore a member of the family, but they may not be necessarily legal dependents. So we're trying to um, cure that language. And I'm so proud of the Bureau because this year with the announcement of this guidance, they have put a form at the back of the guidance to constantly ask for comments in order to correct things like this. So I'm optimistic that we'll get these two aligned very, very soon. Uh, members of families, not dependents, and then age or disability, which is what it says in the statute. And over here in the UDS guidance, you'll notice at the bottom of that column, it says age and disabled, and then it says age or disability. So it's age or disability, and neither age nor disability have been defined. So you could have a 45-year-old who is now working as a teacher's aide, but worked for 20 years as a farm worker, but is no longer physically capable of doing that work for some reason. And that would meet the disability criteria. So next slide, please. So there is additional language in the UDS guidance that talks about the definition of agriculture. And this is a really important addition. It refers to the North American Industry Classification System. And if you've never looked up NAICS on Google, I recommend that you check it out. This is a means of classifying every possible occupation in this country. It is promulgated by the Office of Management and Budget. And in there, they have several sections. So the sections coded 111, 112, 151, and 152 define agriculture. And any workers that are involved in any of those tasks are considered agricultural workers, or that's, excuse me, those tasks are considered agriculture. So next slide, please. So I'm going to give you the statutorial definition of agriculture. The term agriculture means farming in all of its branches, including cultivation and tillage of the soil. It includes production, cultivation, growing, harvesting of any commodity grown in or on or as an adjunct to or part of commodity grown in or on the land, and any practice, including preparation and processing for market. Performed by a farmer. Now, why is this important? We're going to go through some slides that will come up real quickly because for many, many years, people interpreted this as meaning just horticulture. 
because it starts out by talking about cultivation and tillage of the soil. But as you'll see through the next slides, and Valerie will go these, through these relatively quickly. If you'll go to the next one. So agriculture on the land, clear images. Next one. Fisheries, cultivation, I would say that's in the land. So this is cultivation and hatchery versus fishing wild caught on the land, which is not considered agriculture. Next. Transportation provided by whom? If you looked at that definition, it said including transportation. So it really, you know, you would look at that and say, well, maybe one is a farm truck and the other one is an industry truck. It doesn't really matter how new the truck is. What matters is who owns the truck. If the farmer is providing the transportation. Next one is around animal husbandry, which is definitely a part of agriculture. You have cows in a pasture. You have animals that are in a slaughterhouse. Pasture is farming, slaughterhouse is not. Okay, next. Chickens. You've got chickens that are being being raised indoors, and you've got chickens that are being raised outdoors. Those are both farming. It doesn't matter whether they're enclosed or not. So it's all farming. Next. Then there's packing and processing on the farm or in a factory or off the farm. It's easy to say see that that the one at the top left and the one at the bottom look like they're being processed on the farm. And it would be easy to assume that the one on the top right is in a factory, but the reality is that if that factory is owned by a farmer or a conglomerate of farmers, it's considered farming and it therefore considered agriculture. Next. If it's a cannery and a factory in a city, it's not. Horse breeding. So you can take the same horse that on a racetrack is not considered farming, but when that horse is on the farm and being raised or being bred, it's farming. Next. Christmas tree farming and forestry. The key words in that definition were cultivation and production. So you've got Christmas tree farming that's production and cultivation. You've got forestry or lumbering of old natural stand of lumber. That is not. Next. So it all starts here at the registration process. Um, these forms can be very intimidating. Sometimes we just hand patients a form in whatever language is appropriate. But if we ask them a question like, are you a migrant, we're likely to get the answer no. And the reason for that is because there is a stigma attached to the word migrant, because a lot of people don't know the difference between a migrant and an immigrant. Um, and there's an unfortunate assumption that immigrants are undocumented, that are all, they're all undocumented immigrants. So we want to try to avoid that by having an interpersonal conversation, a warm and friendly conversation at the front desk to try to identify our farm workers. Next. So we have the questions here, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time going into them in great detail, but you have them in your handout. And we have worked on these very hard to make sure that these are asked in the right order. And if you incorporate these questions or your own version of these questions into your intake process and into your policies, I think you will find that you are successful in identifying your farm worker families. Next. This is page two of the set of questions. So we, we start out by asking if they've been involved in agriculture. And I'm, <laughs> OK, great. So those questions are there for your reference. And I don't think there's a lot of point in me reading them to you. But we recommend that you consider them and use them if they're helpful. So what are the benefits? Well, first and foremost, it ensures continued funding and availability for farm workers. It is not an insurance. A lot of times people think it is. It is not. Um, Accurate identification and registration helps to facilitate access to care to appropriate treatment. It improves outcomes. It's important for providers to know what kind of work their patients are doing. It improves patient, excuse me, population-specific goal setting and performance improvement. And by ensuring the accuracy of data, it supports service delivery and population research. Next. So we have a number of resources that are available for you, and these are available on our web page. It's real simple. Just Google NCFH. It pops right up. But we have several tools that are highlighted for you there on the left. And the most recent that we have is what we call a digital story on ag worker patient representation. I'm sorry, patient registration. And I encourage you to check that out. 
and it's also helpful if you want to help your farm workers to understand why you need to know the answers to these questions. Okay, next. There is a group of national cooperative agreement organizations funded by the Bureau to provide you with training and technical assistance. And these are the names of those organizations. We encourage you to use their services. And you have websites for all of those, including the National Center for Farm Worker Health there. Next. So I hope that all of you are well aware of the Access 2020 campaign that we've been involved in now for two and a half years. We have three primary strategies as a part of that campaign. The first one we call credit where credit is due, making sure that we're accurately identifying, and that's what today's focus has been on. The second strategy is around what we call open hearts, open doors, and open access, because sometimes when you have a population that is uninsured, they're a little more hesitant to come in. And sometimes we put inadvertent barriers in front of them. And then I'm sure you all know that we have challenges this year in particular with threats of deportation. So we need to bend over as far as we can to help ease those barriers. The last strategy for the campaign is building capacity for growth. And that has to do with the work that many of us are involved in at a national basis in working with the Bureau of Primary Health Care to change administrative language to, to make sure that funding follows increases in population service. Next. We want to offer the first three of you today who register as a member of the Ag Worker Access 2020 campaign a free commemorative artwork poster. This is produced by Aaron Brady, who is from Nashville, Tennessee. And if, in case you're interested in learning more about Erin, she is a 25-year survivor of ALS, Lou Gehrig's disease. The average lifespan from the onset of symptoms from that disease is five years. And this is a digital image that she prepared for us in 2015 using the only part of her body that she can move, which is her eyes. So she has a camera attached to her eyebrow and she picks up each one of those digitals, digits one at a time in order to create this poster for us. So we hope that some of you will um, respond and join the campaign and take advantage of this opportunity. Next. So the next two slides include a list of tips that I have for you to increase access to care. And I'm not going to read them to you, but I'd like to invite you to call me or email me if you have questions about any of them. Some of this we have covered already in the PowerPoint, but it's just a summary, so you've got it all in one place. Um, the last I haven't mentioned, which has to do with forging coalitions with other service organizations and working together to increase access. Next. Uh, yeah, here we go. So over to Colleen at this point. All right, thank you, Bobby. Um, so our second presenter is Colleen Pacheco, the Special Populations Manager with CMAR Community Health Centers, which is located in Mount Vernon, Washington. Colleen will share with us how CMAR approaches the integration of ag workers and their families among their staff and organizational processes. Colleen, thank you so much for taking the time to share your insights with us today. The floor is all yours. Great, thank you. Thank you, Bobby and Valerie. I'm excited to be able to give a brief overview a brief overview of what we've done and are doing to increase access to farm workers. CMAR is an FQHC. We're a community health center, a health care for the homeless grantee, and a migrant health center. We're one of Western Washington's largest providers of comprehensive health and human services. We began 40 years ago this year with a clinic in South Seattle. Today we have more than 138 service sites in 81 locations spanning 13 counties. The green map on the right of your slide has pins representing the cities in which we have facilities and services. Um, our sites are all up and down the west side of the state from Canada in the north on down to Oregon in the south, and we have a few services on the eastern side. Um, there is a mountain range that spans the entire north-south of the state, and which is uh, directly to the right of the bulk of those pins that you see on that map. 
The types of services we have in each city are really based on the needs and resources available in the local community, but altogether we have 34 medical, 24 dental, 30 behavioral health, 9 pharmacies, and a plethora of community services and preventive health services, as well as some inpatient treatment centers and long-term care facilities. In 2016, we saw over 200,000 patients. and we specialize in services to Latinos, but the demographics really vary across the counties. In Skagit, where I work, Latinos are close to half of our patient clientele. We see farm workers in all sites. However, the bulk of the 54,000 who are reported to reside in our network are located within the two most northern counties at the top of that map, Skagit and Whatcom County. Two-thirds are located here, so we have additional programs here to try to um, help increase access. And one of them is specifically focused on farm workers, our Farm Worker Promotores Program. And through that program, um, the, work, the bulk of the work is really focused on building bridges and expanding access for them. It's seven years old, and since the program's inception, we've actually made significant headway in understanding the changing demographics of our farm workers and their needs, and begun building better relationships to build trust, which is essential working with the local community. We've been in these two counties actually about 30 and 33 years because, um, but the program itself uh, is only seven. And um, the next slide, Valerie. So about six years ago, our farm worker numbers had dropped and, and I started exploring the reasons why and uncovered that there were various internal and external factors. Internally, some processes had changed and staff weren't identifying and documenting or capturing all of the farm workers that are actually um, seen. And they didn't understand why it was important either or who actually qualifies as an agricultural worker. Externally, forces were more county specific in Skagit and Whatcom and involved local labor activity, which had reduced key access points, and the demographics of our workforce had changed. The chart on the right shows our growth trend and identifies when notable milestones began. Activities were implemented gradually starting about four years ago, agency-wide and county-specific. The county-specific involved the off-site delivery of services and indigenous interpreters. Um, there's more, but these are the, the beginning of the key milestones, I think. And then agency-wide, the mandatory training and the community development patient registration form here we call the SOGI. Since we joined the campaign in late 2015, our farm worker numbers have increased by 37%. But since 2013, when we actually started um, taking steps to expand access, they've increased by 96%. Prior to joining the campaign, we had begun learning about our farm workers' demographics and that their profound linguistic and cultural isolation created unique challenges and barriers which we had been unaware of previously. But by joining the campaign, we really gained significant administrative support to implement the agency-wide processes, which undoubtedly had a profound impact on initiatives at the two-county level as well. So agency-wide initiatives include adopting new policies on migrant and seasonal farm worker identification, verification, documentation across all departments into their operational policies. We added indigenous languages to the patient management software so we could better identify the interpretation needs and initiated mandatory annual farm worker training across all departments for most staff with patient contact. And then the following year, last year, we implemented the community demographic form, again, the SOGI, which included modified farm worker status questions for patient registration. And I'll talk more about the county specific issues in a minute. But before I do, I have some examples of the tools we use to help identify the farm worker status in trainings and in patient registration, which I'll go into right now. Um, next slide. So these are a few of the tools we utilize in agency-wide initiatives. Each department adopted farm worker, migrant and seasonal farm worker policies, and this is an example of the front desk policy. The training um, is a pre-recorded webinar with case studies and competency tests. It's modeled on the template that NCFH gave us, but it's customized to the local community and our institutional policies. For example, we include a list of common ways agricultural workers locally self-identified and a flow chart that staff can print out and use as a use as a guide for the questions. And the community demographic form, again here at the SOGI, has a series of questions we're required to report on for HRSA about our patients. Um, eat, um, 
and every patient is given this when they check in. And in addition to these questions on status, um, uh, on, on migrant and seasonal farm worker status, housing and veterans, it includes questions on gender identity and sexual orientation. The SOGI and a few handouts from the training can be accessed in the handout section of your screen. Next. And on this slide, I've enlarged the flowchart from the mandatory training so I can go over briefly the four questions staff are trained to ask. Again, they can print this out and use it as a guide. And specific language may also vary as they're taught to actually integrate it more into their conversation. But the first question in the, in the first triangle to the left, ask the patient if they or a member of their families worked in agriculture, forestry, or fisheries as the main source of employment within the last two years. And if they say no, we go on to the question to the right, which is focused on um, determining if they or a family member has stopped migrating because of disability or old age. And But if they answered yes to the first question, then they know they might they they could very well be a migrant or a seasonal worker. So then we move on to the second question down below, the first triangle, um, the first question, and this one determines if they're a migrant due to establishing a temporary home. And again, we also give examples, um, such as do do you live in hotels or share housing with others or live in employer provided housing? And if they say say yes, they're a migrant. And if they say no to this question, we go on down um, to that third triangle, the third question, to determine if they're a seasonal worker, which is defined by if they did not need to establish a temporary home. Next. So on this last slide, I focus more on um, what our county-specific initiatives were. As I mentioned, in Skagit and Whatcom County, it's about it's about where two-thirds of the farm workers and families um, uh, are reported to be living. So we do tailor interventions and initiatives to the local situation. So we knew that our agricultural workforce had transitioned from primarily Spanish-speaking population to some indigenous speakers from Mexico. This was back in 2013, 2012 and 2013, but we didn't realize the extent of this evolution or of their Spanish language limitations, so we began learning about them and asking questions. We were out in the community. We began a farm worker mapping project so we could better identify their demographics, needs, and barriers to accessing healthcare and start building relations and trust. This initiative actually revealed a highly ethnically diverse local agricultural community, one that was actually very migratory, and it included at least seven indigenous Mexican and eight Guatemalan communities and a large Punjabi community, which last year we've made a little more headway into. These communities in the majority don't speak Spanish or speak it proficiently, and most cannot read or write in any language. We did gain significant insight into the linguistic complexities, um, particularly of the indigenous Mexican and Gu Guatemalan communities. There's many cultural barriers to healthcare beliefs and practices. Um, um, for example, there's a, a general lack of understanding of the health processes here in the US really what does sliding scale mean or you pay based on your income. Um, there's also um, the fact that there's a, a general lack of of understanding of why all the paperwork at, during patient registration, why testing, and why oftentimes you just can't get a diagnosis there that you have to come back and have further tests. Um, there's differing health practices. The, the ER and the health clinics were used only as a last resort, preferring traditional healers and, and curanderos, and really um, did not uh, practice preventive health. The findings justified hiring, preliminary findings um, started justifying the hiring of indigenous healthcare assistants, which actually attracted migrant and seasonal workers from other counties. And as we were out in the community learning about them and asking questions and identifying key individuals, leaders started reaching out to us for help and services. So by being in the community, we started building trust. And this, um, to address structural barriers such as lack of transport, childcare, or, or time, we initiated a series of annual mobile medical and dental clinics at migrant camps, farms, and other uh, gathering sites. In the last two years, we've taken 20 medical, mobile medical clinics and 28 dental clinics to 946 farm workers out in the field. We started designing more culturally and literacy appropriate health promotional workshops and materials and going to farms and migrant camps and housing sites. Last year, we initiated a flu and TB camp 
flu and TB campaigns, which uh, involve targeted outreach, including PSAs, canvassing, mobile flu clinics, and workshops, um, including at farms during work hours and other sites. Some farms actually have started creating space and facilities during the paid workday for workshops, obliging their or, or giving more motivation for their workers to attend. We've worked hard to find alternate solutions to overcome costs and transportation barriers and um, have had uh, involved intense follow-up at times to make sure that um, patients get the care they need. We try to really build connections with new farms so we can create access to hidden communities. Over the last four years, we've partnered with eight new farms, um, expanding grower collaborations annually and strengthening the existing farm collaborations collaborations and services we do have. In fact, our close partnerships with a few farms has allowed us to weather labor issues, such as strikes and strikes, um, um, as we're still invited into the farms when others often aren't. We work hard continuously at nurturing these relationships and developing new ones. So really, county-specific initiatives are constantly evolving, and there's many other smaller projects either in the process or on the back burner that are focused on improving access, enhancing um, the clinic experience and improving health outcomes. Some are in the clinic, some are in the community. In the clinic, we have, we've done, um, you know, we've created a tool to help improve provider patient communication. Uh, we're also doing some research on prenatal, uh, prenatal research grant, which is close to completion, but um, to gain insight on practices and barriers to prenatal care so we can create more appropriate health messaging. So this is um, this is really it. This is just an overview of the steps of what we've done. Uh, you know, we focus both locally and agency-wide to expand our access. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you, Colleen. Um, so now we will answer participant questions. Um, so folks, if you have any questions, please uh, use the chat box located on the right side of your screen to submit them. And Colleen, the first question is for you. Um, the county-specific initiatives, can you explain a bit more about how those came to be and if there's partners involved? Yes, hi. Um, so, yeah. Um, the county specific initiatives, well, um, you know, uh, CMAR has been in Skagit and Whatcom County uh, as long as, and we've been providing outreach to uh, the farm worker community for as long as we've had a primary care clinic in each county, which is 30 and 33 years. So for many, many years, we would do migrant outreach um, in the summer, and there were different departments that were responsible for this, but it was really going to a set number of farms in each county and um, doing many health fairs, which was health screens and um, trying to provide information. But when, um, but this program came on and there were a couple years of, of trying to get things settled. And then um, when I came on, they actually took over that migrant outreach. And we just started really re realizing that the numbers were decreasing and that people didn't really come to the health center and they weren't interested. Or maybe they came years ago, frankly, and didn't understand why they couldn't get their issue resolved or didn't understand why they come in and then they get bills and they, they didn't get their issue resolved. And ultimately, through um, talking to individuals, we just realized they, they also, they were, they were really different with different health perspectives, as well as really just the proficiency really varies across uh, linguistic communities and, um, and gender and age. But um, in Skagit County and Whatcom County, the demographics even vary too. In, in Skagit County, the main population is indigenous Mexican, one particular community, the Mistecos. Um, Clickies are another large community. Those are the predominant ones here. Um, but even in the Mistecos community, there seems to be, uh, from what I've read, up to 52 different languages, but what we, dialects. But what we do know is that um, they are unique to each town individuals are from. And there were, there were there's some towns, most of the town is up here now. Um, um, but they're really unique. Individuals from different towns could not communicate with others. And so we started 
really recruiting and reaching out um, both in our promotores program as well as hiring interpreters through these communities and started gaining more more trust and more insight and um, and then just you know just really just started reaching out to folks and had some focus groups with another grant I had and then just interviewing people and meeting with them we want to learn more about your language and about your community and so through that trust started being built and then we also uh, in Skagit County in particular there's eight town councils where the community is really still their self identity is really tied to the community so we realized we had to like really get in with those communities and start to d develop relationships through the leaders and so um, it's, it's a constant work in progress but it started that way and then just continuing to reach out and, and ask questions and that's how we started um, getting more and gaining more insight on all the different communities we have um, in terms of community partners I'm sorry what the other part was did you ask how we got involved with the farms um the question was to just um, clarify and gain more insight into how the county specific initiatives came to be and if you do that in partnership with other organizations like a health department yeah um we no um it, it was just really just internally driven like what um you know we're constantly evolving um evolving it seeing what opportunities are out there so as we started learning more about the farm workers and what their needs were it's like you know what there's transportation is a really key issue and we realized that the mini health fairs taking them blood pressure and blood sugar wasn't really um the most um efficient for them um and um we we just we we realized we we wanted to take these mobile medical and dental clinics. Uh, dental care is um, a major gap in the community in both counties. There's just never enough dental space in any of the clinics that do provide it, and these individuals have less ability to get there. So that's where we how we started initiating those for the dental clinics and the medical clinics. I um, you know I just started reaching out to other community partners. Um, the dental clinics we do we work with medical teams and national which um, provides dental um, vans um, domestically and so I've for about five years we've worked for work through them and um, I just have a you know I go out sometimes in the last few years our dental staff have participated but really I recruit a lot of dentists and hygienists from outside in the community um, and uh, we go to farms and camps and really just meeting the farms it's just you know we know that there's a lot of hidden cultural communities and if there's 54,000 out there where the heck are they so it's like we need to identify where they really are a lot of farms have hidden um, hidden housing sites um, and there's a lot of farms there's just a lot of farms out here that um, uh, are smaller um, or are more reticent um, uh, to open their doors or not really interested and so we just kind of work every angle we can to try to this is a big farm we may work on it three years and then we have community partners who are like hey I have a good relationship with them I'm going to say something and then if they have a good relationship they can keep pitching it and then all of a sudden yeah you're in come in and talk to them so I, I work every angle I can and, and the ideas just kind of come and germinate based on what we hear and, and who we meet wonderful thank you for sharing um, sure. And Bobby, our next question is for you, and it takes us back to slide number seven, which I'll pull up on the screen here. Um, and it's dealing with the first two definitions here, migratory agricultural workers and their families and seasonal agricultural workers and their families. Um, the question is, are they both seasonal? Are they both considered seasonal? It's it's interesting because if you think about it, seasonal basis, which I've highlighted in red, is a phrase that were that refers to the length of their employment or the seasonality of their employment. Seasonal agricultural workers mean something totally different. Really, what they're it, it's it's confusing wording. You know, you have to think about this. This language is gosh, what fifty fifty two years old, 57 years old now. Seasonal agricultural workers and migratory agricultural workers, the only difference between them is that migratory workers leave their home and sleep overnight someplace else in order to do work. Seasonal workers don't migrate. 
they stay home and they go out and they do day work here, day work there. They may work on the same farm or they may work for several different farmers, but they don't migrate. So it's confusing because we use the, the word seasonal in two different ways. One is to describe their lack of migration, and the other one is the seasonality of their employment and their income. Most farms are seasonal. People could argue that dairy farms are not, that you still have to milk cows on a year-round basis. I guess it depends on what you do on that dairy farm, because if you're involved in cutting hay and baling hay, that's very seasonal. If, if you're milking the cow, but you know, most of the time they're using equipment these days. Wonderful, thank you, Bobby. And um, so we don't have any more questions today. Um, so I just wanna thank all of our participants for joining the webinar and taking an hour out of their day to be with us. Um, there is an evaluation link located in the questions box. If each of you would take a minute or two to just provide your feedback on today's webinar event, that is greatly appreciated. Um, and both webinars in this series will be archived on the CHANCE YouTube channel and Distance Learning Events webpage. Um, NWRPCA will also archive uh, these events on their Learning Vault, and links to those are located on your screen. Um, they are also located in the handouts as well. Uh, and I will include um, these resources in a follow-up email to all participants after the event. Again, thank you for your participation in today's webinar, and thank you to Colleen and Bobby for sharing your insights and expertise with us all today. Um, and thank you all for the work that you're doing in your communities, and, and I hope you all have a wonderful afternoon. Thanks again. Thank you.